between 1776 and 1965, six American presidents whose words, actions, and deeds went beyond the call of duty from the ordinary to the extraordinary and made the words that Thomas Jefferson penned in the Declaration of Independence come alive. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Two of those American presidents would die by assassination. We present the first three, Thomas Jefferson, President Abraham Lincoln, and President Harry S. Truman. Picture this. A group of politicians from the 13 American colonies come together to plot what turns out to be a revolution. A contentious Continental Congress needs to set forth some convincing reasons for declaring war. Congress turns to a brilliant 33-year-old aristocrat from Virginia, Thomas Jefferson. In a matter of days, the red-haired wonder writes one of the most celebrated manifestos for human freedom and self-government in the history of Western civilization. The Continental Congress authorizes Philadelphia printer John Dunlap to print 200 broadsides, poster-sized sheets. The document, unsigned, is then rushed to waiting horsemen who put it in their saddlebags and gallop throughout the colonies. See, if this revolutionary war is to be won, thousands of farmers and tradesmen must be persuaded to take up arms and fight. And they do. And not many people realize it today, but scholars believe Jefferson intended for the Declaration to be performed and not just read. Its words and rhythms were written to be spoken in proud and defiant tones in grand public places. It's a safe bet that the Continental Congress never had in mind a performer like me, that is to say, a black man. Thomas Jefferson was not ignorant of the problem of slavery, of course. He called it a moral and political depravity. And in the original draft of the Declaration denounced the slave trade as a cruel war against human nature itself. But Congress thought better of this particular item and deleted it. In fact, there was no mention of slavery or black people or of women, for that matter, in this preeminent statement on the equal rights of man. So it makes you wonder, how could a man who himself held slaves write with such incredible passion and eloquence about human liberation and the promise of a democratic republic? Why, some may ask, do I bring up such embarrassing truths on this glorious occasion? I answer, the real glory of the Declaration of Independence has been our nation's epic struggle throughout history to close the gap between the ideals of this remarkable document and the sometimes painful realities of American life. The Declaration symbolizes the birth of our nation, of course, but also the constant struggle to achieve its ideals. Consider, the words of this document inspired the French Revolution in 1789. 200 years later, the revolt of Chinese students in Tiananmen Square. It inspired Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, Martin Luther King Jr. to fight for civil rights, and women's suffragettes to fight for the vote. This business of fulfilling the Declaration of Independence is a difficult struggle, but it is also an ennobling struggle. Jefferson called the Declaration an expression of the American mind. It is why this nation is so great and why I am so proud to be an American. Here now are those sentiments as first expressed in this very place. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, 
and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. The Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. Whereas, on the 22nd day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States, containing, among other things, the following, to wit, that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, an executive order that proclaimed the freedom of enslaved African Americans in states that had seceded from the Union. Over two years later, the Civil War was ended, and by December of 1865, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified, abolishing slavery in the United States. Each of these steps helped nearly four million former slaves gain their freedom. These African Americans faced a long, difficult road to independence. And for many, it was a challenge even to find shelter and work. One of the first steps President Lincoln took to help them was urging Congress to establish the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, more commonly known as the Freedmen's Bureau, in March of 1865. The Bureau helped former slaves secure jobs by drawing up labor contracts and providing temporary housing, food, and medical care. It was also tasked with reuniting families that were separated during the Civil War. The Freedmen's Bureau legalized marriages and kept detailed records that are housed in the National Archives to this day. But perhaps its greatest achievement was in education. The Freedmen's Bureau established thousands of Freedmen's schools in the South increasing black literacy to above 30 percent. It also built several colleges that are known today as historically black colleges and universities, like Fisk University in Tennessee and Howard University in Washington, D.C., granting more than a thousand college degrees to African Americans by 1872. The Freedmen's Bureau's accomplishments did not come easy. Its efforts were not supported by the majority of white Southerners, and many white Northerners were ambivalent toward its goals. After President Lincoln was assassinated, Vice President Johnson took his place. As a Southerner, Johnson had little sympathy for the former slaves. He quickly cut funding to the already unpopular program. At the same time, white people that worked for the Freedmen's Bureau often had to deal with ridicule. Even so, many Bureau workers stayed in the South, helping the reconstruction effort by getting involved in politics, renting homes, and rebuilding their own lives and the economy as well. While the lack of funding contributed to the disbandment of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1872, its influence is noteworthy. For many African Americans, the services of the Freedmen's Bureau were a vital source of support as they created new lives and sought to claim their new freedoms. In the wake of the American Civil War, the nation entered into a time period called Reconstruction, in which the nation was attempting to piece itself back together after four years of bloody fighting. 
An integral part of Reconstruction was the extension of rights to former enslaved African Americans. Through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, slavery was abolished and rights were guaranteed. Unfortunately, however, despite official changes to the U.S. Constitution, racism and discrimination still existed and fair treatment of African Americans was by no means guaranteed. Some did seek to aid former enslaved people, while others sought to keep former enslaved people in a state of slavery. One important measure that was taken to help former enslaved people was the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau on March 3rd of 1865. Just as the 13th Amendment had passed Congress to abolish slavery, and barely a month before Lee would surrender to Grant, effectively ending the Civil War. With the war coming to an end and the 13th Amendment on its way to ratification, the government began to realize that there would be now over 4 million former enslaved people seeking work, a home, land, medical care, education, basically all of the rights and privileges that they had been denied by slavery. The Freedmen's Bureau goal was to aid in the transition and help former enslaved African Americans as well as, as some poor whites in the South in establishing themselves. The Bureau was put under the control of the War Department, as many former Union soldiers who fought in the war now found themselves working in the Bureau, attempting to help those left homeless after the war. The Bureau helped in providing food, medical care, clothing, housing, finding work for former enslaved people, and even opened schools to educate those who had been denied an education. The Bureau helped former enslaved people find family members that they had been separated from because of slavery. But again, racism and discrimination was rampant in the areas in which the Freedmen's Bureau operated, and so organizations such as the newly formed Ku Klux Klan attacked those working for the Bureau and burned schools operated by the Bureau. The Bureau suffered from lack of money, as you know, many political leaders such as President Andrew Johnson argued against the Bureau and vetoed legislation to further fund it. This led to years of argument and debate in Washington over the Bureau's work, and by 1872, the Bureau came to an end. As I mentioned earlier, some sought to help former enslaved people, while others sought to keep them in a state of slavery. One popular method of this was what was called sharecropping. As the war came to an end, large landowners in the South found themselves without really any money and no labor force to operate their large plantations. The plantation owners created an arrangement in which they provided former enslaved African Americans a place to live, they gave them seeds to plant, and farming tools to work with. But in return, the landowner would get a share of the crops that were harvested. Of course, since the landowner had to borrow money, they bought seeds and tools on credit and went into debt. They then, of course, passed this debt on to the sharecropper. The landowner could then lie about the cost of materials or the value of the, the sharecropper's harvest, and so now the sharecropper was in a virtual state of slavery to the landowner and would have to borrow from the landowner. And, you know, as the Bible verse says, the borrower is slave to the lender. There were other variations of this system, such as shared tenancy and, and tenant farming, which offered more choice and freedom to former enslaved people, but nonetheless, former enslaved African Americans remained at a very low status economically in the Southern society. Despite the fact that slavery had been abolished, former Confederate states began passing laws within their own states that heavily discriminated against former enslaved African Americans. These laws became known as black codes, basically trampling the rights of former enslaved people. These codes included laws such as African Americans and whites could not intermarry, African Americans could not serve on juries, or could not testify in court against a white man, uh, could not own land, and also required African Americans to sign contracts with landowners to work on their land, for example, in a, in a sharecropping situation. And then, if they did not have a contract, they could be declared a vagrant and arrested. Congress, of course, attempted to intervene with the actions of the Freedmen's Bureau and the passage of the 14th Amendment, which attempted you know, guarantee citizenship to former enslaved people and guaranteed protecting their rights. These measures aided in overthrowing many of the black codes. Unfortunately, however, as time went on and into the late 1800s, enforcement of the 14th Amendment and protection of rights began to grow weaker as many former Confederate states began passing what were known as Jim Crow laws that discriminated against African Americans and sought to take away their rights. 
The period of Reconstruction would have long-lasting impacts on American society that we feel even to this day. The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois Herein lie buried many things which, if read with patience, may show the strange meaning of being black here at the dawning of the twentieth century. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American, without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. This, then, is the end of his striving, to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use his best powers and his latent genius. These powers of body and mind have in the past been strangely wasted, dispersed, or forgotten. The shadow of a mighty negro past flits through the tale of Ethiopia the shadowy and of Egypt the sphinx. Through history the powers of single black men flash here and there like falling stars and die sometimes before the world has rightly gauged their brightness. Here in America, in the few days since emancipation, the black man's turning hither and thither in hesitant and doubtful striving has often made his very strength to lose effectiveness, to seem like absence of power, like weakness. And yet it is not weakness. It is the contradiction of double aims. The double-aimed struggle of the black artisan, on the one hand, to escape white contempt for a nation of mere hewers of wood and drawers of water, and on the other hand, to plow and nail and dig for a poverty-stricken horde, could only result in making him a poor craftsman, for he had but half a heart in either cause. The full racial immigration of the military is more recent than you might think, coming about in July of 1948 with President Harry Truman's official issuing of Executive Order 9981. Truman stated, There is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry, or religion, or race, or color. 9981 was another step beyond President Franklin Roosevelt's Order 8802 banning discriminatory practices by federal agencies. Civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph was an influence behind these executive orders, convincing both Roosevelt and Truman to uproot discrimination in the armed forces. Truman's Executive Order 9981 further cemented equal treatment in the military and allowed troops of various groups to make level contributions in service to the United States. The day in 1948, President Harry S. Truman issued Executive Orders 9980 and 9981, which began the process of desegregating the armed forces and the federal government of the United States and helped kickstart the modern civil rights movement. By 1948, African-American soldiers had distinguished themselves in every major conflict since the Revolutionary War. Black volunteers served with various South Carolina militia units, including those of the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion, half of whose force sometimes consisted of free blacks. These black troops made a critical difference in the fighting in the swamps and kept Marion's guerrillas effective even when many of his white troops were down with malaria or yellow fever. A militia unit, the Louisiana Battalion of Free Men of Color, fought with General Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. During the U.S. Civil War, nearly 200,000 African American men comprising 163 units served in the Union Army, and many more served in the Union Navy. Both free African Americans and runaway slaves joined the fight. During World War II, African Americans once again stepped forward to serve. There were 125,000 African Americans who were overseas in World War II. 
famous segregated units such as the Tuskegee Airmen and the 761st Tank Battalion and the lesser known but equally distinguished 452nd Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion all distinguished themselves throughout the conflict. With victory over season World War II achieved, black soldiers returned home. Despite their gallant service, many African American soldiers returned home to the same discrimination and segregation they knew before the war. On February 12, 1946, just hours after being honorably discharged from the United States Army, Sergeant Isaac Woodard was attacked while still in uniform by a South Carolina police chief as he was taking a bus home. The attack and his injuries sparked a national outrage. Film and radio legend Orson Welles helped bring the attack to the national attention and to the attention of U.S. President Harry S. Truman. Good morning, this is Orson Welles speaking. They didn't give me a chance to explain. The policeman struck me with a billy across my head and told me to shut up. When President Truman learned of the attack on Sergeant Woodard, a U.S. service member in uniform, he was disgusted and became determined to address racial discrimination in the armed forces and the federal government head on. On June 26, 1948, over the objection of senior military officers, Truman issued Executive Order 9981 banning racial discrimination in the U.S. armed forces and Executive Order 9980 to integrate the federal government. Between 1776 and 1965, there were six American presidents who went beyond and above the call of duty. They went from the ordinary to the extraordinary. On part two of We Are Sinners Saved by Grace, we present President Dwight D. Eisenhower. President John F. Kennedy, President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Their words, deeds, and actions, and their journey from the ordinary to the extraordinary, landed them a spot in the Democracy Hall of Fame by making the words of Thomas Jefferson come alive. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. You're listening to Electrify Mojo Rare Moments. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you wish to subscribe, hit the subscription button. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you wish to subscribe, hit the subscription button. If you wish to subscribe, 